I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swarzik, and today I have, by popular demand, Jaden Quinlan, our senior ballistician, and our lead lab technician, Matt George. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Sure thing. Welcome. So, the first episode, episode 103, if the listener out there has not listened to episode 103, they need to go back and, and check that one out, and it is, Should You Clean Your Barrel? And that episode, as it turns out, in two and a half months of existence, is one of our top five most listened to and downloaded episodes total. So, cool. Uh, definitely a lot of people out there wondering, should I clean my barrel? How often should I clean my barrel? What do I clean my barrel with? Should I look at it? Should I get a bore scope? You know, there's a lot of things that people, I think, took away from that podcast and a lot of things that they were anxiously waiting for. And we alluded to a second episode. And as it turns out, we will probably have a third episode. Because uh, this episode, the reason we brought you on, Matt, is... You know, as as the the lead guy down there, you see, I don't know how do you know how many barrels you have in service right now? In service, we probably have about five hundred. Five hundred barrels. We've got a vault full of test rifles, so we have barrels on barrels on barrels. And you keep a very very uh, attention or a high attention to detail for each barrel. And you know, you've been doing this now for well over almost probably almost two decades, huh? Darn near. Yep. Darn near. Mm-hmm. So. uh Nobody has more experience in our company in the break-in procedures, the maintenance procedures, the cleaning procedures uh, than you and your team down there. And so that's what I want to spend today's rifle barrel cleaning or pistol barrel cleaning for that matter talking about is, you know, what you've seen, what you found to be most effective, um, and then maybe get into some horror stories. You know, have you ever ruined a barrel on accident or on purpose? Um, And what are some tips and techniques so before we get into today's episode and the topics we want to cover, I do want to go back a little bit and kind of review what we talked about in episode 103, which is why you need to clean a barrel. What's happening in your barrel that would make you need to clean it? The carbon, the copper. Jaden, you had a nine pound ball of propellant here right in the middle of the table mm-hmm. uh, that really illustrated that well. So just in quick summary, why do you need to clean a barrel? Yeah. Well, first off, I probably probably need to apologize to the to the listeners or viewers i i think they really wanted like episode two right after that first one aired i wanted episode two right after that aired. uh, so that's my fault um got pretty busy and then we had you know trade shows and and stuff like that i think i think that was maybe even before like christmas and stuff so it was two and a half months ago yeah that math would add up yep um the things kind of hit the fan yeah sorry sorry we didn't get to to filming this sooner um we ended up really busy. So yeah, we had, uh, in that, in that podcast, the illustration we had used was we actually poured powder out on the table to give a visual of, you know, how many rounds you fired with different cartridges and how much powder you've burned through that, you know, that little hole in your barrel. Uh, we talked a lot about the theory, um, of pressure and velocity and how cleaning or not cleaning, you know, um, can impact that. Uh, we also talked about the effects on dispersion, uh, a little bit, you know, throwing back all the way to the the dispersion podcast itself. Um, so, I mean, really, the, I, th- I think the conclusion to that that hopefully everybody reached was, yes, I do have to clean my barrel. There's still some big questions out there. One of them is, well, how do I clean it? What do I clean it with to, to get, you know, the most effective uh, method? And then also, <clears throat> how often should I clean it? Which I think that will probably turn into episode three. Right. We're working on, you know, right now you ask somebody, you know, the, there's two questions that are both like equally tied in in lack of data, which is barrel life and and how often you should clean it. And both of those things, you ask that to people, and you get totally random answers. Yeah. They're all they're all usually based on personal experience or historical knowledge. You know, if you're in some sort of uh, say uh, organization where you use essentially the same equipment all the time, yeah, you might have some some historical data built up, but but there's nothing based on like the fundamental principles we went over of how it works, like how propellant burns and what it leaves in the barrel and, and deposits of copper from the bullet and all that stuff. So from a functional standpoint, can we try to generate an answer to 
how often you should clean or how long your barrel is probably going to last for different categories of, of barrel life. So that'll probably be episode three. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, as a quick review, I think that's kind of mainly what we went over on the first one. Yeah. And the, the, the summary there was there are implications for improper barrel maintenance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether that be dispersion, whether that be accelerated uh, barrel wear out, uh, un expected pressure problems Mm -hmm. all the Uh, way up to safety problems all the way up to to safety concerns there are implications to improper barrel maintenance and i think one of the other things we mentioned was even people that say never clean your barrel usually the comma next part of that sentence is never clean your barrel until you see pressure problems you see accuracy degrade you see velocity get more erratic things like that so uh, there are very few folks out there who are actually taking a barrel from start to finish having never cleaned it and in you might be able to get away with that in a six five and larger diameter if it's not too overboard like a throw eight winchester for example but you start doing that in a little hot rod six or something and that can have some some lasting repercussions up to and including the cost of that barrel uh and you know finishing its life early yeah well that's one thing we're going to try to get to <clears throat> with episode three is the more definitive answer to that because the guy's going to ask well Okay, yeah, 308 lasts a while, but I'm not shooting a 308. This is what I'm shooting. How? What is the reference to yeah. a known? Yeah, you know, because right now, if you ask me, or if you call tech, or you ask Preston behind the camera, the answer is clean as he did. Right. Yeah. There's a lot. It's so much nuance to that answer. Um, so let's change gears a little bit now to get into kind of our practice and our tools and our methodology. And to to preface that, Matt, you've got accuracy barrels you've got pressure and velocity barrels you've got actual rifles um, and i'd like to focus almost exclusively but we can talk about other stuff on the, your pressure and velocity barrels because you have hundreds of those in service right now down in your lab and we have reference ammo Jaden, you've mentioned many times on this podcast not just actual sammy reference ammo but right. like you as the reloader you as the hand loader you as the shooter you can get ammo verify the lot number, get enough of it as a known standard, Mm -hmm. and then use that as your reference ammo for your guns and your barrels. Mm -hmm. But for us with our P&V barrels, we have reference ammo, and it's accepted it has to fall within this pressure and velocity window. And then we get to see how our barrel interacts with that ammo, and then what our maintenance and cleaning schedule, how that affects the results that we get. So when you get a brand new barrel in, beautiful cut rifled steel, not a single round on it, you know, it's not going to last forever. Uh, what do you do right when you get a brand new barrel? Well, we'll start off with a break-in process. We have a pretty simple process. It's at least we're going to shoot one box worth of ammo, so 20, 25 rounds through that barrel just to get everything smoothed out, just to get some rounds on it. Uh, and from then, we will qualify it using that reference ammunition. So we don't really have an elaborate break-in process. It, it seriously is just fire rounds on it. We don't do the, the shoot and clean, you know, every shot. Uh, it it doesn't need that shoot much. a five it's shot test yeah, okay mm-hmm. and over time right yeah we're not going oh, yeah. and shooting 25 Bang as fast 20 as you round. can yeah a thousand dollar barrel with a several thousand dollar transducer right. in here yep. i'm just going to beat on it yeah yep. and as we're as we're shooting those rounds we're we're clocking them on the chronograph too you know we're, we can see a, a shift in the velocity as you start putting rounds on it you can see a change in the pressure mm-hmm. uh, so and it's you, usually pretty low mm-hmm. i mean i i think that's a uh, Jacob's been doing a study on, on barrel break-in with a bunch of different types of barrels. And, I, you know, one thing we've observed with, we're, we're using very high quality barrels in, in our test barrels. Every single one is a cut rifle steel. Yeah. yeah. And because you don't want to have to question the result of the test because, well, is the barrel right or not, you know? So we're, we're using the highest quality barrels we can get. But I mean, in my experience, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> when, when maybe I put the very first shot on the barrel, it's, it's observably different than the second shot, but you know, shot two, three, or four are almost imperceptible to the ones to fall. Like it doesn't take very much, and I mm-hmm. think that correlates to the quality of barrel manufacturing today. Sure, um, th- they're just not real rough. They're mm-hmm. very consistent. You know, there's a lot like of that. them hand lapped. Sure, yeah, twenty rounds isn't going to do a whole lot to that steel. Uh, like Jane said, that first shot's a doozy. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's definitely an outlier. So that that primary round you put in there. Uh, is odd okay and then the following rounds usually the last 15 you're going to look at those those velocities those pressures and go everything's yeah. stable this barrel's ready to qualify with the reference ammo. okay so before you get to uh shooting your first assessment with the reference ammo talk about that break-in uh what solvents are you using 
to, to do that break in? Is it a, a mixture of stuff or do you just kind of have a go-to? Uh, our go-to is, is going to be the Bortec eliminator. That's, it's kind of the do-all of solvents. It, it does both the carbon fouling and the copper fouling. It's pretty mild, non-hazardous. You know, it, uh, in, in terms of our selection of, of that uh, particular cleaner, uh, most of what we were looking at was just something that was non-hazardous just due to the location where we clean our barrels. Uh, something just didn't have the, the, uh, the VOCs, the, the volatile odors and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd have people walking in from uh, out, out in the warehouse into the lab. And uh, it just about knock them out when yeah. they come in when we use back in the old eyes. days, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, no ammonia. And do yep. you you scrub that in with a brush, or are you just kind of patching it through and letting the solvent do? Oh, uh, we do some some wet patches. You want to wet that bore, you know, get out all the the big, big clunkers that are in there, mm-hmm. uh, and, and get it ready to brush. And we do use bronze, just regular bronze phosphor brushes in there. Uh, every once in a while, we can hit it with a nylon brush if it's something we don't really want to to scour on. But uh, for the most part, just and just a few strokes it no, probably doesn't yeah, take much. It's, it's not uh, death by a thousand uh, strokes there. It's it's just maybe 20. Okay. 20 in, 20 out, and, and that thing is about all it needs. Um, mostly all the brushing is doing, and you can brush it on barrel forever, and you're never going to get all that stuff out of it. You need to let the solvent do the work. So we'll let a we'll let a wet barrel sit. So after we're done brushing it, we're going to run another pretty loose-fitting, saturated patch down that board just to mop all the junk out, get all that, that fouling that's loose, and then the, the stuff from the brush that gets left behind. That way it's just the solvent and and the, the gunk that's built up in the, in the barrel walls. And then let it sit 10, 20, 30 minutes yep. overnight? Mm-hmm. Usually about 30 minutes uh, is, is more than enough. Okay. Uh, if we, need, you, we can check it incrementally. Just you know run another wet patch down and see what comes out. Okay. Yeah, and then patch it out dry. Mm-hmm. Do you follow up with that? Uh, uh, you know, a lot of folks will patch it out mm-hmm. dry, and then I've seen people run alcohol through it. I've seen people mm-hmm. run... Uh, mineral spirits, all kinds of stuff to dry it yep. out. Do you do any uh, of that? Yeah, by the standards of, of pressure testing, we, we get all that residue out. So what we use is we use isopropanol, just a 99% uh, alcohol, and, and just clear all that stuff out and just leave behind a little of nothing. Excellent. So then now you've got that barrel. You've done a very simple break-in, and I'm going to call it break-in process, but that, that just that term break-in mm-hmm. kind of brings some dogmatic stuff with it. But you, you season the bore. You're going to right. get that first round, you said, which is a doozy. Uh, then after that, it, it starts to continually get more stable and more stable. By your last 15, 10, 5 shots, it's really imperceivably different. And now you're ready to make your first assessment. And we have SAMI reference ammo. And that's something that most folks probably don't quite understand. That there are certain companies, if you, know, if you introduce the cartridge, you have obligations for proof and reference ammo. Mm-hmm. And reference ammo is loaded to a very specific pressure and velocity, and that ammo can be used to make assessments on other pressure and velocity barrels. So if we introduce the 22 ARC and Federal wanted to load ammunition, they could order reference ammo so that they can calibrate their pressure and velocity barrels. Right. Yep. Yeah. Now that, that system of reference ammunition works, it's, it's really nice, you know, as far as a, an industry uh, coming together, you know, it's, it's, we call it, kind of call it a, a competitive cooperative yeah. in terms of yeah. what Sammy is. Cooperation. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is we will, we'll submit a, uh, a lot of ammunition that we say, this is set aside as reference only. Uh, we'll send it out to all the other labs that have capability to shoot it. They're going to send their results in for pressure and velocity. Uh, from a 10 string, string into SAMI, uh, their technical office, they will compile that into an average. So we will shoot our, our barrel with that same lot of ammunition, look at the average that came from SAMI, and whether or not our barrel is within the inclusion limits of those standards is, is how we decide whether or not that barrel is qualified for service or if we need to put a corrective offset into those pressure and velocity values. Okay. Which that's, <clears throat> that's a, a, really, uh, a really interesting concept because so far we've been talking about cleaning. But the other thing that that reference check does is is ensure that your dimensions are correct. So if, uh-huh. if you have incorrect dimensions, bore and groove dimensions or chamber dimensions, generally that's going to have an effect on the measured pressure and the produced velocity. Absolutely. Um, and so many times, you know, we've had we've had barrels that are out of spec, right? We we bring them in <clears throat> and uh, do the break in on them and do the first uh, the first firing of reference ammunition, and it's it's so far from what it should be, something's wrong. And then you start going in and, and you investigate that barrel and maybe you find, you know, the, the bore dimension is tight by a certain amount. That's going to produce higher pressure. So it, it, it's great for a, from a cleaning standpoint, like we're talking, but it, it can also be used for, for checking 
it's not a measurement of a dimension. It's more of like a kind of very rough, like pass fail type thing. Like, mm-hmm. does this thing fall in alignment with where it should be or not? And you can use that on, on rifles too. Cause we've seen that very commonly, you know, we get a, a customer that complains of, Hey, this, this ammunition is high pressure. I'm, you know, blowing primers or whatever it is. And, uh, you're, you're able to get a hold of that, that rifle and check it out. And, uh, yeah, it produces way higher, uh, velocity, velocity numbers. Can't measure the pressure in it, right? It's not a pressure barrel, but the velocity numbers are way higher out of this thing than they are out of the exact same length pressure and velocity barrel. Velocity is generally correlates to the, to the barrel length pretty well. So what is going on? Why is that thing producing higher velocities and therefore higher pressures than this known qualified barrel is? You start investigating that that barrel on that rifle and you find there's something wrong dimensionally so yeah it, it's a it's a really good tool yep that is a definitely a good tool and then yeah like you mentioned you can do some investigative stuff with uh Serosafe is a wonderful product mm-hmm. uh i think it's available through brownells uh that you can cast your chamber and the, i think the spring back is just a couple tenths of a thou it's usually um, pretty good yeah. yeah so you can actually get some good measurements from what's going on inside your chamber and, and investigate things that way mm-hmm. so very, very helpful for a variety of things, having a known reference ammo to compare to. Find the latest shirts, hats, hoodies, and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at HornadyGear.com. So you go through that, you do your first uh, reference assessment. If it's not uh, perfect, you can put some sort of corrective values on there as long as it's you know there's a specified amount with that yep yeah usually with rifle ammunition you get plus or minus 50 feet per second plus or minus 3500 psi uh so with it if it's within those limits you got a good barrel Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's outside those limits you got to take corrective action if the barrel is is high in pressure high in velocity generally you can rectify that uh either by lapping the bore or maybe run a run a new chamber reamer in the thing and, and see what comes out uh, if it's low on values, if you, if it's not making enough pressure, not making enough velocity, that thing's out. That barrel's mm-hmm. completely disqualified. There's nothing you can do about low pressure, low, low pressure, velocity. low velocity. Wow. Yeah. That's but a, it, it is pretty common that you you see that that they're tighter, right? That the like typically with a chamber reamer, <clears throat> if a if a guy's chamber and barrels and he's trying to pinch pennies, you know, and he's making that reamer last as long as he can, that reamer is going to wear down, and so. As you continue to use it, it's going to cut smaller and smaller dimensional chambers. Generally, yeah. that's associated with an increase in pressure and yeah. velocity. And so, like you said, Matt, you know, sometimes you can come back in uh, and and chase it out with a n- known spec chamber reamer, and oh yeah, it cuts a little bit of material out, and then that barrel yeah. starts to shoot just like it should. We've done that with some factory rifles where you get a seven PRC and it's exhibiting signs of high pressure. Sarah safe the chamber, uh, isolate some. Okay, that's a problem point. Take a brand new chamber reamer that is sammy spec on the plus side of sammy spec because that's another thing people get probably confused on is you can order a sammy min spec reamer but it's not going to do you a whole lot of good if you're covering multiple guns it's right. it's certainly okay to order a sammy max spec reamer and it's going to be just as accurate as anything else anyways take that reamer by hand three four twists problem solved yeah it's uh, it's surprising how little material correlates to such a change in in performance yeah it's pretty wild yeah so that procedure you just talked about matt uh do you guys use that in rifles not just pressure and velocity barrels but now i'm talking shoulder filed fired rifles that you guys buy or build is that a similar procedure that you guys use when you get a new gun or a new barrel yeah i mean it 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 really provides you that foundation to be able to assess off of as you move forward shooting that rifle Mm -hmm. um i use uh i use wipeout quite a bit or patch out um I kind of prefer the the patch out. That's another one we found that's a, a pretty decent solvent that that doesn't produce, you know, like a, a hazard as you use it or whatever. Um, I've had really good luck with it. Um, but yeah, it's the same process Matt's talking about here. And, Get and, a few rounds on the barrel. And yeah, I can't measure pressure in, in this rifle, but I will, you know, whatever those first rounds are through it, say, you know, I, I we do the break-in or whatever you want to call it there, just getting the barrel to stabilize um, once it's stable, yeah, I might gather some data on, you know, 20 rounds or so, and I'm going to measure velocity and dispersion on those. And then I'll document that data and I'll have some of that ammunition set aside. Um, even if I'm hand loading, right, I'll just load, load myself up an, an extra set and I keep that kind of for the rainy day. And then as I begin to use that thing and 
try to keep a round count on it, you know, as, as well as you can. Uh, Matt's method in the lab is awesome. Every single round is accounted for. Yeah, we'll talk about <clears throat> that here in a moment. Um, but as you're going, you know, hey, my <clears throat> my groups are starting to open up or uh, I happen to measure my velocity again and I've picked up like 40 or 50 feet a second. This is kind of odd, you know. Then I can go back to that that sample of ammunition, shoot it again. Oh, yeah, it's also up 40 mm-hmm. or 50 feet. Clean the barrel shoot another sample of that reference that I held, it's back to where it was. So you can start to gauge your effects. Yeah. And that's something that I've done personally as well on my rifles. Uh, I get a new barrel or I build a new gun. Generally, I will clean the barrel out with isopropyl alcohol and then I'll take a first shot and then I'll clean it. Generally, I've been using Bortec Eliminator probably Mm -hmm. since 2015 or 16. I'm not sure when that product came out, but for a long while, I'll clean it after that first shot and then I'll just shoot a five shot group in a five shot group until I have a box of 20 consumed. Uh, and I'll usually clean after every of one of those five shot groups in the last, you know, the last group isn't five shots, but, uh, and then I'll leave it fouled. And then I just go to using it. I don't not doing a ton of specific breaking. I'm just using, um, that eliminator during that first box of ammo. Mm-hmm. And then I'm, I'm going to work. But what I do is after that first 20, somewhere within the first hundred rounds, I will take what I consider the standard, and it's not reference, but if it's a 6.5 Creedmoor, I'm going to get a box of 6.5 Creedmoor 140 LD match. And if it's a 6 arc, I'm getting 108s. And if it's a 7 PRC, I'm doing 175 Precision Hunter. I just have my, you know, kind of my go-to pet loads there, Mm -hmm. and I'm not getting a whole bunch of the same lot and storing it as a quote-unquote reference, but I am taking a box, and I'm just going to see what the velocity is and what the accuracy is because of all the guns that I've built, I just have some, okay, I, I know this is generally going to shoot really well from all of them, and I know what the velocity should be about, and then I log that away in my notes tab on my iPhone mm-hmm. and move on and, and you know, hand load for it and shoot other stuff. But I always have that saved just in case. Yeah. So, Matt, I want to go back to your uh, cleaning and reference and, and all of that, sir, for your pressure and velocity barrels. Like Jade mentioned, you guys now digitally record Every round fired in the lab. You've been doing this now for quite a while. Um, why is that important? And and is it some cartridges more important than others to keep such a really scrutinized, documented round count? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Throughout the the, the life of a barrel, we want to just track the uh, the, just the, the performance. performance. You know, uh, seeing where things are dropping off, and just historically too, so we can go back and look at you know old barrels compared with new barrels. How long are these? Are we expecting these to last? I mean. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to really quantify how long a barrel is going to going to last, but in terms of primary, usually the the amount of powder burned and the velocity uh, both determine you know how often we're going to check those barrels, how much we need to clean those barrels, <clears throat> and that's it's definitely a, a big tool uh, just just to be able to have a huge sheet full of just round counts of of hundreds of barrels. Yeah, well, probably at this point, thousands of barrels. Oh yeah. Um, is there some uh, correlation like you mentioned between powder burned and velocity achieved um, that make them more maintenance intensive. We talked about that on the first episode where you can't get away with doing back-to-back tests without a cleaning in between or, or what have you, or how often do you clean when you do test? When we do testing, we usually don't put more than 20 to 25 rounds on a, on a test barrel. Um, we definitely clean that barrel at least the end of every shift. So every 12 hours, we're going to have solvent in that barrel again. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of what you see is uh, a lot of it could, could be... Uh, attributed to just the propellant even used. You know, you might oh, have, sure. you, you know, this cartridge might have 70 grains of this propellant, and then you try 70 grains of next propellant, and it's, uh, you see completely different burn characteristics. Mm-hmm. You know, might, you might be getting similar pressures of velocities, but just the way that powder burns. Yeah, the chemistry, yep. the chemicals used. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And that's part of why it's so hard to get a straight answer, you know, because it depends on so many things. Sometimes it depends on the barrel. I mean, we've seen that too, where take the same ammunition, and this barrel here just is problems its whole life and this barrel over here is like smooth sailing you know Mm -hmm. so like there's so many different things that get a vote in in the the complete answer that it's kind of a unique yeah like miles says barrel's got attitude everyone's different yeah yeah but there's you know there's definitely you know just through production in the lab their cartridges or, or the barrel that we're firing those cartridges from are are viewed differently it's not all the same you know like a a nine millimeter you can get away with quite a few rounds on it before you start to build anything up but you shoot uh 
you know, generally the smaller the bore diameter and the more powder you're trying to burn through that, I think we talked about that in the last podcast, the more cleaning sensitive it's going to be. So the more you don't clean, the more likely it is you're going to start to see shifting performance. Yeah. And I think the PRC family is a great example of that, which one, we addressed with different sizes of cartridge cases. We've had a lot of people in the 7K mount that wanted a full 300 length case. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that cases are different sizes, but in the PRC family, you have a 300 PRC, a 7, and a 6.5. And in my anecdotal experience, I'm not in the PNV world, but in my anecdotal experience, the, they get progressively more maintenance intensive the smaller the bore diameter gets. So the 300, you can almost, not you can't get away with murder, but it's just less sensitive. And the 7 kind of like, you know, a, a magnum hunting cartridge. It needs to be cared for. And the 6.5, if you properly maintain it, is awesome. But if you veer off the path of barrel maintenance, you can ruin the barrel oh, in yeah. short order. Mm-hmm. And you can do that with anything. But I've known, I've noticed that of the three, the 6.5 PRC, a little bit more maintenance intensive than the 7, and the 7 slightly more than the 300. And a lot of that comes down to, obviously, propellant burned, velocities achieved, and the bore volume. Because they all achieve almost the same velocity. Mm-hmm. If you look at the precision hunter load across the board, not precision hunter, excuse me, outfitter, mm-hmm. the 190 CX is doing 3,000. The 160 CX is doing 3,000. The 130 CX is doing 3,000. Yeah. So same velocity, smaller bore diameter. Right. Yeah. And you're, you're, that, that ratio is really where kind of the rubber starts to meet the road because that's getting into how it works. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the amount of powder you're attempting to burn through a certain volume, the temperature that that powder is going to be at, the characteristics of it. Not all powders burn the same way. Some of them, in our experience, some of them will build up carbon at a, you know, that hardened carbon, like in the throat that we talked about. Right. Yeah. Um, that'll build that up substantially faster than some other powders. And there's, yeah, there's just so much to it that. Yeah. If back to your original analogy, I think, which was if you have a race car, you have to maintain it like a race car. It's not a grocery getter. Yep. That applies in the cartridge world as well. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta use that premium 104 octane race fuel. Yeah. Um, but we'll do wild stuff too. I mean, our standard practice is what Matt's talking about, where it's a very controlled, very regimented method, but we ruin stuff too. We break stuff on purpose yeah. to see what happens. You know? Well, let's, uh, before we get, because that's our next topic, I want to uh, divulge quickly into the how we ended up with Vortec Eliminator, Wipeout, Patchout. There's a lot of good solvents out there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot that are really, really effective. Um, how did you end up? finding, okay, these two are what's going to work best for us. And then we'll, we'll talk more about some more aggressive cleaners and maybe some abrasive cleaners later on in the podcast. But for right now, you know, for the general maintenance cleaning, okay, I just, I'm not scrubbing stuff to bare steel. I'm not trying to, to, to I have an, a, an acute problem and I'm trying to fix it. Just I'm trying to take care of a barrel. Vortec Eliminator's done well for us. Wipe out, patch out. Um, how did you arrive to that solution? Mm-hmm. So pretty much, um, I've been using an eliminator uh, since we were in the old, you know, yeah. the underground laboratory. In the, in the By the gallon. Building. Yes. And uh, the original bottle of Bortec I ever used was this little eight ounce black bottle and had a paper label on it. So we just, we experimented with it and tried it. And we get that a lot where, you know, there'll be these new products that come on the market and they'll, and they'll say, hey, lab, try this. So, so we'll give it a whirl. What we need in a cleaner for, for the lab is, is something that does it all. I mean... If we're cleaning 25 or 30 barrels at the end of every shift, you know, you don't have to, you don't want to run three different solvents and, mm-hmm. and have all these different mm. uh, procedures in order you have to, to do all these operations. I mean, we need one, one product that does it, does it all. Uh, we were all very happy with, with the patch out uh, or the wipe out, the, uh, the foam. There's, yeah. That's a great one too. Um, but we settled on, on the eliminator uh, just because it seems it doesn't really have an odor. Uh, you can get it on your fingers. It, it's it's non-hazardous, which is number one thing pretty much for a work environment, mm-hmm. you know, as far as, you know, just the operator safety. And you, you, know, you don't want to be exposing guys to chemicals, you know, every single day of the week. Yeah. Because yeah, these guys are cleaning barrels every day for mm-hmm. half an hour to an hour, like the shift change time. Like, it's not like, oh, I go clean one barrel, which is what most of the listeners are going to yeah, have for is. their experience. Like, no, you're cleaning, you clean what, 10, 10 to 30 I'll barrels 10, every day. 10. So your exposure... To that is is serious. Okay, like so that is saying. important. That is a, a yeah. unique aspect, uh, and it does do it all for the most part. Yep, yeah. yeah, it's 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 a great copper solvent. You know, it's a great carbon solvent, and and for the most part, it, it does both equally well. I mean, they make uh, 
specific dedicated, ones yeah. just for those. But for the most part, we get everything done with, with just the eliminator. Awesome. Well, I think I would like to say too, because people are going to listen and they're going to hear, you know, the, the products we've named that we use. And the reason that we named those is because they work for us and that gives people something to use that, hey, maybe, you know, if, if they want to try it. But if, if your question is, well, does this solvent work or does this solvent work or does this solvent work? Try it yourself, but use that reference ammunition to make that judgment call. There you go. Because as, as just a shooter, you're limited in your instrumentation on how you can quantify whether something was effective or not. And, and that reference ammo is a really good way to do it. So yeah. if, you, if you've got a rifle that you've been shooting the same load through forever um, and, and you have some of that ammo, then clean that barrel with whatever solvent or method or whatever you want, whatever works for you. And, and then see if there was any effect on that reference. Yeah, that's a good point. And, I, and it does kind of drive home kind of the overarching thing that I've tried to portray in the podcast. I know you, you too and, and Miles and everybody has is we're not telling anybody what to do. We're telling you what we've tested and what works for us. Again, lots of good solvents from a lot of brands out there. Um, and the Eliminator works mm-hmm. well. They're individual solvents. They're CU2 and, and then they have a, a, a carbon one as well. Those work great. It's just not as convenient. And then the wipeout patch out, uh, I'm not sure of the chemical difference, but they work in the same manner. I've had great experience with them. The wipeout, I can load up a barrel with the foam. I can forget about it till the next day, the next week, and go in there, patch it out, and it's a clean barrel. It's yeah. about as easy as it gets. And I forget which barrel maker said this uh, to me or to us. But anything you can do to keep a cleaning rod out of the barrel is probably a good thing just because there's some, you know, if you get stuff not aligned or, you know, they, they, he was referencing, he's seen barrels ruined by just people going crazy with a drill and a cleaning <laughs> rod and going nuts. And it's like, so the, the wipeout, better. yeah, the, the wipeout works great because spray it in, a couple patches out, clean it out with some alcohol and, and you're good to go. Sure. Um, so that's what's worked for us over the years. And again, we're knocking on a decade of using those two products again not exclusively um but look at this 100 free bullets when i buy these select hornady reloading tools wow 500 free bullets with certain hornady reloading presses and kits well what do they have let's get loaded there's no better time to stock your reloading bench choose from the most durable precise and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded Visit Hornady.com for further details. Next time we get loaded, I'm buying. Let's shift gears a little bit to bring up what Jaden had brought up, which sometimes you guys get wild. Sometimes things break. Sometimes barrels get straight up ruined. Uh, let's dive into a few of those stories. Well, uh, here's an extreme example of, of another reason why we, we use the solvents we do. Is I, I was doing some testing on the extreme limits of what I should have been doing. And ended up sticking some bullets in some barrels. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever stuck a bullet in a barrel, it doesn't want to move again. Like no. you can go whacking on that thing with a rod or a hammer all you want, and the bullet's going to give. Not like its position in the barrel, but the bullet itself. Its yeah, you push the right? red core yeah, out. Yeah. yeah, you'll poke a hole in the bullet with a rod. Um, and so the last bullet I stuck was in a six five barrel, and it was a it was six five Creedmoor, and it was a. It was a 160 round nose, so very long bearing surface bullet. Yeah, um, engraved like from <laughs> front to back. The worst case you could have for a stuck bullet trying to get it back out, right? And uh, that was in your Hummer barrel. It was. Yeah. So quick, uh, quick divergent tangent here. Uh, Jaden has a barrel that's magic. I don't know. He he got a, a incantation, you know, uh, with the ear of Newt mixed up a batch, and <laughs> and and it's a it just it shoots everything bullet on top of bullet on top of bullet. And it's got way more rounds on it than should be still shooting yeah. even remotely well, but it still just pounds knot holes. So not only did you stick a bullet, you stuck a bullet in a you know witchcraft barrel. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, well, you know, we we have done testing like you know that how does it how do how do these solvents handle copper? You know, will they will they you know break it up or whatever? And same thing with carbon and stuff. And so I thought, well, let's see let's see how much copper these things will eat and so i used some solvents and dripped them down the bore into that stuck bullet let them sit and uh after enough time it ate the bullet jacket away to where the bullet i was able to essentially tap it out with like a wooden dowel rod and so i wouldn't recommend that as a reference for people to test solvents right like don't go sticking bullets in barrels and see which solvents will eat the bullet jacket away enough that the barrel comes out but um 
but that would just be a kind of a I guess a funny story of yeah, some of the extreme stuff, stuff we ended stuff. up doing. But yeah, you've done some extreme stuff, and that's uh, well, that was one of them. Yeah, but yeah, as far as seeing seeing what a barrel will take from an abuse mm-hmm. standpoint, we have got plenty of those. Yep. Yeah, we did some experimental stuff with with uh, an exper- experimental barrel steel mm-hmm. that we just hammered rounds on. I think I shot twenty ten shot groups on it, uh, just one right after the other, and and monitored the pressure and velocity throughout that whole run. And you just see probably the first 100 rounds, the thing is starts climbing. You know, the pressure and velocity are following. Uh, and then you get to about 100 rounds, and velocity kind of plateaus, but the pressure just keeps climbing. Mm. And another 100 rounds later, and you know you go from, from what essentially shot 59 or 60,000 PSI, and now you're up into 74, 75,000 PSI just because you're, you're laying down material in that bore. Mm-hmm. What cartridge was that? That was a 300 PRC. Oh yeah, big one. Uh, and for the listener, you know, when you open your bolt and there's no primer in the case, that's 70 to 74,000 PSI. Yeah, that's, that's right up yeah, there. Yeah, and if you really got to lean on that bolt to get it open, you know, that's a good sign that it's time to clean. Yeah. So let's talk now uh, uh, less about like the maintenance cleaning, where we talked about the eliminator. There's a bunch of other good solvents out there, wipe out, patch out, and many, many others. That's kind of the maintenance cleaning. You're breaking the gun in, you know, every, depending on what you're shooting, every two, three, four hundred rounds, whatever your cleaning schedule is, it's just a maintenance clean to, to keep you shooting. Well, let's talk about when you got a problem, because we talked about what the, the dreaded carbon ring, which understandably for the listener is not generally a complete 360 degree carbon ring. Usually it's just on one part of the circumference where you've got some hard carbon deposits. And sometimes that will engrave into the bullet when you go to chamber it, and it's going to immediately drive your pressure up. So, one, before we talk about how we get rid of that, let's talk about how you identify it. So, one, yeah, okay, your bolt doesn't want to open, you're missing primers, erratic velocity, erratic erratic pressure. But it's really handy if you can see it. Mm -hmm. And we, what do you guys use for bore scopes in the lab? Uh, The Hawkeye? it's It's a Hawkeye, yep. Yeah, so... Generally, the Hawkeye, for the hobbyist, outside of the price range most people want to spend. But there are some more affordable bore scopes on the market. And if you're a, a, an advanced hobbyist that are, you know, you're shooting, if you're to the point where you're shooting barrels out, whether in a competitive fashion or, you know, colony varmints or whatever, it would probably behoove you to have some sort of barrel monitoring device. You know, the Lyman make the digital bore scope for just a couple hundred bucks. Um, there's one on Amazon that I believe is called Tess Long, um, that Preston behind the camera here uses. And it's like ridiculously inexpensive. Plug it in. I think you plug it into your phone or plug it into your computer and you can see what's going on in the barrel. And the prices on that equipment is coming down and it is incredibly handy to be able to isolate. Oh, there's a problem right there. I can see it right there. Yeah. Uh, or you know, look at your fire cracking and, and all of that stuff. But you can really quickly identify a problem area like a carbon ring if you have a way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you get some erratic pressure velocity, you you know, you know get a, a good maintenance cleaning, you go back in there to take a either shoot reference assessment or to shoot a, another test sample. Still crazy, you put the bore scope in there, you see what looks like a carbon ring. Now, what are the next steps to help get that thing out of there and can you get it out of there? Yeah, for the most part, we're going to soften it up as best we can, usually with a carbon cleaner, you know, something like the the Bortec uh, Carbon Remover. Uh, there's other other good carbon removers out there too. Um, KG has a, a really good carbon remover. Um, Sharpshooter used to have the carb out. I don't know if that's still available. Mm. Uh, we still have one one golden bottle, I guess, we're hanging on to. But, yeah. Uh, for the most part, uh, soften it up as best you can. And do you then, plug the bore and just fill it up and let it soak? Or no, you and for the, the most part, a, a lot of these gun cleaning solvents work best when they have contact with air. They need that that oxygen oxygen to to really get them going. Okay. Um, that's why stuff like the the wipeout is really good because it's it's very aerated because it's a foam. Mm-hmm. Um, that's stuff interesting. Like, yeah, stuff like the eliminator actually doesn't work uh, very well uh, if it doesn't have air. Uh, you need to. It's good to know. Yeah, uh, so you have stuff like uh, Patchat has the uh, the accelerator. Pretty much what that is 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 just an oxidizer that really boosts the the cleaning power of that. Uh, Oxy when, clean. Have, when you don't have a whole lot of time to yeah to to let that barrel soak, you can kind of kind of speed it up by, by that's yeah, interesting. Using that. Um, but for the most part, yeah, you, you, you need some air. That's that's the one of the most re- uh, biggest reasons why Bortec recommends the nylon brush because that nylon brush just 
just working up a, a froth in, inside the, the bore aerates. aerates the solvent and really gets it going. Just like your lawn. You need to aerate it every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't need you don't need to attack with a, a bronze brush just to get the solvents to work. Okay. That's yep. interesting. Mm-hmm. So you soften it up with a dedicated carbon or uh, yeah, carbon solvent just mm-hmm. to try to because that carbon can get really hard, like mm-hmm. borderline mm-hmm. diamond quality, it seems yeah, like. You, and if you hit hard carbon with a, a bronze brush, all you're doing is making it shiny. Yeah. yeah, you're not you can polish <laughs> you're any polishing your carbon. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you got to soften it up a little bit, and for that, you use a dedicated carbon solvent. Right. Yep. Let it soak. Mm-hmm. See how that does. So we'll run a run a patch through there, check it with the bore scope. You know, see is it still there? You know, uh, if it's not giving up the ghost, then we got to get mean. All right. What What does it mean to get mean in regard to a carbon ring or some really stubborn carbon? You're gonna need an abrasive, so okay. we we will start small. This sounds taboo. Yep. There's uh, uh, Bortec does a, a a kind of a bore polish polishing cleaner. Uh, they call it Chameleon, and mm-hmm. we can kind of go at it with that. If it's just if not too stubborn, that usually takes it right out. If it's if it's easy to remove, okay, because it's and real fine. Are you making full passes? Are you using a nylon brush? Uh, or are you using cotton? Usually, we'll just work it. You know, we'll start at the the chamber in at the chamber end where the throat is and, and you kind of work it back and forth and then in- incrementally increase the stroke until you're out the muzzle okay with a brush or with, uh, with cotton? uh we usually use the uh, a cotton patch cotton with mm-hmm. the jag on yep. it so not like the needle point poke the patch over mm-hmm. this is like an actual like dewy jag with cotton wrapped around yeah, it right knurling on the outside yeah with of the, the jag yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. so uh, if it's, if we need to get more aggressive, we'll get into something like the, the JB bore paste. JB bore paste is another uh, really good carbon rover. Uh, you definitely know with the JB, uh, if you have carbon in there, because usually the first couple inches you run that down, back it out, look and see if that thing is black, you're going to be working on it for a while because it, it only shows carbon. Mm, interesting. And so JB kind of the next step up from the bore tech mm-hmm. chameleon, yep. uh, and where do you go? Well, do you have any other abrasives that you guys use in the lab? We do. We also use the IOSO bore paste. Uh, uh, their cleaner is is more aggressive. Okay. Uh, probably about the, the the top end of what most shooters should use. Okay. Uh, they recommend using it with. They have a nylon brush that they sell, a little blue blue brush. Uh, you apply it to the brush and then then work it like you would the other cleaners. Uh, that's usually the final step that that gets pretty much all of it out of there. If, yeah, and I think the key takeaway here is go slow. Yep. At what level of abrasive, you know, the Chameleon, the JB Bore Paste, the IOSO, do you have to worry about, okay, if I go too too aggressive with this individual abrasive, I can cause more problems than... I think you'd have to be pretty focused-minded to okay. uh, damage a bore with JB. Okay. Uh, if you get crazy with the IOSO, yeah, you can, you can get in there and start attacking the steel mm. and start rounding off your lands and, and opening up a, a little divot in your groove and then you're in trouble okay not to mention ever, also also the uh, transition from the chamber into the bore you can start to erode that away oh like the commencement of the rifling you mm-hmm. can kind of make that a little more rounded uh, have you ever done that i've tried not to no yeah. uh, has anybody in the lab ever done that i don't think anybody's gotten that that involved okay well, that's good because yep. uh, uh, i was gonna i wanted to hear about that story i'm gonna stay quiet mm-hmm. jason just have you ever done kidding. that I was going to say <clears throat> the other thing we've messed with when it comes to abrasives is like fire lapping concept. So where yeah. you take abrasive and you essentially coat the bullet or you buy a, a bullet that is already made that way or whatever. Um, yeah. You better be careful with that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've had some fun on a Friday afternoon with a barrel that was going to be out of service, you know, just to see what the effects were. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can do some, you can do some things yeah. with that. Yeah, you can change. I don't, I don't and the pressure. Know. Oh yeah. I don't know that if I would recommend it. Okay. I don't know. But That's good to know. I would say a controlled method that Matt's talking about <clears throat> where you're assessing, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling the, the jag back out and assessing the color, you know, like how much carbon is this thing, you know, taken off with what I've done so far. And then bore scope is a huge, huge yeah. benefit. And again, back to reference ammo again, you know, if, if you don't have the bore scope, you don't have much if you have some 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 of the reference ammo in a in a chronograph you can start slow and go shoot and did anything change no okay and go do a little bit more but but again you you can ruin barrels this way so it's it's a it's a caveated recommendation okay well and i would advise at least me personally i haven't had to to get crazy with abrasives in any barrel on a personal note i have you know in my days in the lab uh 
I would not use an abrasive if I didn't have a way to look at it, like with a borescope. I just wouldn't do it. Because on a, well, on a personal note, I paid for this barrel. Last thing I want to do is end up like what you said. Uh, and one, I want to see the ring and I want to see the progress I'm making if, I, if that's what I'm attacking. And, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, if you don't want to drop the hundreds of dollars for a, a Hawkeye or the, you know, two or 300 bucks for the lineman, you can get some cheaper ones on, on Amazon that still allow you to see inside the bore and make sure you're not doing more harm than good. Yeah. Now, I've heard a lot of guys too, that'll take, they'll take, uh, either a, a patch or, or cotton or whatever they're using as kind of the, the carrier of the solvent itself to get it in the barrel. And they'll, they'll run that in till it's right at the throat and then they'll leave it, you know, maybe leave that soaked patch sitting there on mm-hmm. that surface overnight. I've heard a lot of guys do that. Yeah. Um, that's not something we do in the lab just because that barrel needs to go back in service, you know? Yeah. Um, we need to be efficient with our time mm-hmm. because that <clears throat> implicates other people's time. The guy running the press, the guy shooting the test, right. a lot of people in that line. So if you're, you know, as a, as a, as a listener, you're likely not in a position where that gun has to be back up and going right away. There's certainly circumstances where that's the case, but you know, don't be afraid to take your time, you know, and, and, and do the cleaning in the, in the least riskiest method. If you have time at your disposal, yeah. you know, uh, one thing that's something we don't have in the lab. We have to get that thing going. Right. Well, that's a good point. Take your time. We have to do things right. The Hornady security fireproof keypad safe. With a heavy-duty 16-gauge steel body, extra-thick 8-gauge steel door, and four 1-inch diameter locking lugs, the Fireproof Safe achieves a fire rating of 30 minutes for up to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Both the interior and adjustable shelf are covered in a protective carpet that offers flexible storage configurations while safeguarding valuables from damage. The Fireproof Keypad Safe from Hornady Security. One thing we haven't touched on yet at all We've been talking about pressure and velocity barrels. So this is, you know, a barrel of a certain length with a big collar and the chamber starts at the end of the collar. So we have direct access to the chamber. Well, in a rifle, you got to get through the action generally. Uh, You guys use bore guides on your rifles when you clean them. Yeah. Yep. There's probably no reason not to at this point. I mean, you can buy them. I think you can buy them at Walmart. Sure. You can buy it, you know, an inexpensive bore guide that's going to be better than nothing have you found a specific bore guide that works really well for you in the lab we have the just the possum hollow ones i was going to say on say, an individual yeah. note the possum hollow ones you got to buy them specific to uh cartridge but or yeah generally cartridge cartridge family if you will but man they yeah they seal the chamber off with a little o-ring they keep the the, the cleaning rod lined up right down the bore mm-hmm. really efficient a lot mm-hmm. of them have a little port where you can pour solvent in you're not dripping it on your stock and stuff. They work really well. And I don't know if it's how much merit it has, but I feel like it's an important step as a rifle owner to have one of those. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can argue the merit of, of like the efficacy of how straight does it keep your rod? You know, does it yeah. keep it from hitting sidewalls or whatever? I'm sure there's a varying degree of, of benefit there. Um, but the one thing that it definitely seems to help with is keeping the solvent out of the action and as much of it out of the chamber as you can. Yep. And that's probably something we should touch on is should you should you leave anything in your barrel after you're done cleaning? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one area you don't want anything to be left is the chamber. So that can that can create some major problems for you. Essentially, if you leave any sort of lubricant or solvent. or solvent or any liquid, it can be water too, uh, you know, from rain or whatever when you're out in the field. If there's any liquid that's on the walls of that chamber when the cartridge is, is chambered, the the level of grip that the cartridge case can get on the chamber when it swells out and grabs the chamber walls is going to be reduced. And that means that the force that's pushing back up against the, the cartridge case head up against the bolt face yep. is going to be increased. So you can see signs of pressure that may not be from pressure at all. The... the, the, the lubrication in that chamber isn't going to change the the pressure potential of the propellant had no effect on that can't even touch it um <clears throat> but what it will change is the perception of pressure and a lot of times you leave some lube in there and you're going to on a low level case you're going to see maybe a leaking primer right you have gas flow that's leaking around the primer around the primer pocket one step further than that is a, a blown primer right the primer comes out that 
that enters into the the dangerous territory, right? Because you can you can lock up a firearm with that circumstance if the primer gets down into the fire control group or in the barrel extension or any of the rotating mechanisms of the bolt, you can lock the gun up. Now, for the hobbyist at the range on a Saturday afternoon, that's not that big of a deal. But for a guy working in a profession where his life is tied to that firearms operation, yeah, certainly something to consider. Um, and then as you continue on, I mean, you can you can get to the point where you know you can get enough swelling <clears throat> due to that increase in bolt thrust from the cartridge case head that you might not be able to get that thing back out. It might lock the entire system up. Yep. Um, so don't keep any lubrication or liquids in your in your chamber itself. Now in the bore, I mean, where we're using stainless steel barrels for the majority of our stuff, I don't. I I keep them dry. Okay. Um, but you know, let's say you have an old chrome molly barrel and you look at the, you know, on the outside of it and it's been sitting in the back of the gun safe for two decades and it's got some rust spots starting on the outside. It's, you know, natural to think, well, if it's on the outside, it might be on the inside. So yeah. some guys might want to use, you know, some sort of a, uh, lubricant or some sort of protective, uh, yeah. you know, coating on the inside of there. That's fine. Um, I just make sure that thing doesn't get back, back down in the chamber don't leave so much in there and then orient the rifle vertically upwards where the ch chamber is below the the bore to where that stuff can migrate its way back down that can cause big problems yeah i agree i uh uh yeah can second that for sure on the chamber side uh the bore mops or the chamber mops that i've been using are just from tipton mm -hmm. uh, tipton cleaning accessories i have a, a ton of that stuff no affiliation there it's just it i like their cleaning rods i like their jag sets i like I maybe mean, i've got a bunch of their stuff just because it seems to work well it's affordable i can get it locally it's sportsman's warehouse whatever but the, those chamber mops is what really what i've been using every time I'm, i clean just give it a couple spins in there make sure you dry it up yeah on the bore side i use stainless barrels almost exclusively as well and things like my race guns or my 30 30 lever action or, or whatever you know uh uh that I'm not going to use or is seasonal in use. I'll usually clean it at the end of the season or the end of its use case. And then I'll just take a patch and spray it with one shot gun cleaner and lube. And I'll patch that through and then I'll patch a dry patch behind it. It's going to put some sort of oil down the bore mm -hmm. to help with, you know, pitting or just sitting for months on end. And it's not heavy enough that it's going to be actually running. There's not enough in there to actually drip back into the chamber. And then before I go shoot, when I get that gun out for the season, I usually patch it out again with some alcohol and mm -hmm. shoot a couple of fowlers and go to shooting. Yep. And that's kind of the nice part about like those aerosol <clears throat> gun oil type things like our one shot product or whatever is, is you can, you can get the patch wet, but without it being like dripping wet compared to like a, you know, a, a, you take liquid a dropper. dropper bottle, right? Yeah. Like you're, you're probably going to get so much on there that the chances are you're going to have some left behind or drips or whatever, right? It's not going to be the minimum application approach. Yeah. Excellent. So Getting back to a, you know, barrel maintenance, you know, we have kind of our preventative, our, our routine maintenance, if you will. And then we've got, you call in the, the big dogs, get a new abrasive if you need it for carbon. Uh, and kind of the last thing I want to talk about is your guys' thoughts on scrubbing things down to bare steel. Because um, that's something that largely I don't recommend very often, like for, you know, the PRS crowd. It's like, okay, you're shooting a 6547, 6.5 Creed, or a 6 dash, or whatever you're shooting. Like, if you keep a good routine level of maintenance, then you really don't have to just scrub things down to bare steel. Because I've seen, you know, on like a cut rifle four groove barrel, you scrub that thing down to bare steel, and it, that first couple shots can be a little squirrely. Uh, so, when do you guys scrub down to bare steel? Because I might be totally off base in what I just said. That's just anecdotal. So, what have you guys seen in? The pressure and velocity spectrum which it sounds like you are cleaning you know because you want a, a known standard versus what you see in your competition in hunting rifles i would say it, it really depends on the cartridge itself and kind of what you're doing you know like in the bench rest world <clears throat> you'll hear a lot of guys that that they will do that right they're cleaning between strings of fire sometimes and and that might be beneficial from the standpoint that uh from a you know, let's say bare steel cleaning to round 20 is less of a change in the barrel than it would be from round 20 to round 200. So from a consistency standpoint, cleaning back to the baseline of bare steel and then working up a known amount and just staying within that window, sure. you have a repeatable contribution of 
that changing condition, bare steel to fouled, that you can you can depend on. So that might be a place where it's valued. Um, now in, you know, like you said, like a PRS or a field style match competition or three gun or something where by nature of the competition, you're not going to have the opportunity to clean and you're going to shoot such a high volume that you're going to experience big changes, right? It might be better in that circumstance to not have a bear start with bear steel. I don't think anybody out there does um, because you're going to have more of a shift from a bear steel barrel to 200 rounds on the barrel than if you have 40 rounds to 240. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I would strategize it that way, probably more so than a blanket answer. Okay. Yeah. What that about makes you, a man? lot of sense. Yeah. In terms of just, you know, stuff I can see on the lab, uh, it gives us a pretty good idea. You know, what level of cleaning do my own rifles need? I mean, in terms of a, a long range bolt gun, like a 300 PRC, I try to keep it, you know, as clean as possible just to keep it consistent. I don't shoot long strings of fire with my gun. So, you know, if I'm just going to shoot five or 10 rounds, there's no reason not to keep it moderately clean least yeah. clean yeah that makes sense on the pressure and velocity side these things are getting scrubbed down to bare steel for the most part every shift mm -hmm. uh, and that's like you mentioned Jaden, because you're that zero to 20 25 rounds is going to be the window it lives in we can get it back to the known standard take mm -hmm. it to a known point and it just kind of lives right in there yeah it's a repeatable process yeah not super applicable to almost all of the shooting sports except for maybe the bench press crowd uh, which they are, you know, they're controlling every single variable that they can and shooting impossibly small groups at at, at range. So that's interesting. Uh, I think that'll be better answered in the third episode sure. where we go through the the calculation of the cleaning intervals and stuff like that. Yeah, yep, and that that's going to be helpful for the industry. I think is you know that yeah you get the you ask ten people twenty answers about I don't know, clean when you need to or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's kind of a wishy washy way to say things. Right. So. I well, appreciate that, guys. Uh, I think that gives the listener one a much uh, more very or a, a very specific answer out of podcast number one hundred and three, which was what solvents do you use and how do you use them. Generally, that was. I mean, we got piles of emails and comments on that one, so I think that will go over well with the listener just to peek into what we use, what we found that works, and mm -hmm. you know, if you have something different out there as a listener that works for you, we'd probably like to know about it sure. because. We're not married to any of these products. We just found what works. And if there's something that works a little bit better, we'd like to know about that as well. And before we go, one anecdotal story about my first week at uh, Hornady Manufacturing working in our ballistics department. Jaden, you went to somewhere. Like the first, I was like, well, I get, this is small alone now. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm not sure what to do. And uh, that was when the 6.5 PRC was was. Uh, had been introduced and was soon to be accepted by Sammy. Uh -huh. uh, and somebody had taken a 6.5 PRC pressure and velocity barrel uh, just, a, just a little too far and had one of those dreaded carbon rings. And so Lowell uh, was was uh, running the lab down there at the time and looked in the bore scope. All right, you see that? Yep, okay. And it was like almost half the circumference of the barrel. I mean, it was it was pretty significant. Of carbon buildup? Of up? carbon buildup, right okay. there, right in the transition into the rifling, and nothing would touch it. I mean, nothing. Like like you said, it, it just got really shiny, is all it got. Yeah. So, uh, Lowell said, we're going to try to try to correct this. This is the last resort, because those barrels, the pressure and velocity barrels are between 800 and 1000 bucks per barrel. Well, that's what they were when I was working in ballistics. I don't know if sure prices went up since then. So you got $1,000 of a barrel sitting here that in 40 rounds might be completely ruined. All right, this is, this is going to be our last Hail Mary. I've done this before. I'm going to show you how to do it. Go up to the tool room, and we're going to get some diamond rouge. We're going we're gonna to get some polishing compound, diamond polishing compound. I said, lol, this sounds really wrong. <laughs> uh, but the rouge we had had different colors representing different abrasives. And he said, you're going to scrub it five strokes with this one. You're going to clean that out. You're going to look at it. We're going to do five strokes with this one, clean it out. And if we have to, we'll do a couple strokes with this one. It's going to be gone. We're going to shoot three to five shots. You're going to shoot reference ammo. It's going to fall right back into inclusion limits. Okay. And it felt really wrong. Uh, and I'll be damned if it didn't fall right within inclusion limits. Yeah. But that was very delicate like i said just 
two strokes in, two strokes out, four strokes, or maybe, you know, it, it, six strokes rather. Uh, it was very small, very small movements. I was like, you're probably nervous. My first week on the job, and I've got this thousand dollar barrel that I'm going to have to go put in the scrap bin. Uh, but yeah, it worked, and and to see it uh, with the uh, the Hawkeye to be able to see actually start to get rid of it, and and that last little bit just took it right out, shot some fowlers, and it fell right back in there again. Felt really weird, but that was you know going back to talking about the extreme ranges of things or some of the weird testing we've done. I would have never ever put diamond compound in a barrel and i certainly wouldn't recommend it but this was a hail mary and it saved the barrel and it you know went through the rest of its uh p and v life which on a p and v barrel is not very much i think on 65 prc you might be taking that thing to eight hundred thousand rounds maybe oh probably 1500 yeah yeah, life's pretty good on them oh okay Mm -hmm. well uh so yeah 1500 rounds later it lived its life and we saved it but it felt felt really wrong yeah that's (laughs) funny uh, so anything else on this part of, you know, part two of barrel maintenance, barrel cleaning, should you clean your barrel? Um, you know, obviously we know you do need to clean your barrel. Is there any tips or tricks to make your barrel last longer? How can you make it last forever? Ooh, forever. I, I think, uh, the barrel makers wouldn't like a forever barrel. That's probably true. But, uh, you have the answer to that though. Yeah. <clears throat> you've put the, you've tested this. I have tested this theory does work. You yeah. want your barrel to last forever. Mm-hmm. Don't. Don't ever shoot your gun. Yep. yep. Yeah. You can put it in the lab. They look you good on the wall. Bring it to work every day. <laughs> take it home. Yep. Put it up on the rack. Just dry fire it. That thing will last forever. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have to clean it. <laughs> that is true. Yep. Um, yeah. Barrel maintenance. I mean, have some sp- have some respect for your gun. I mean, don't just try to do an endurance run on the thing. I mean, I'm sure they look cool, you know, on the internet, all dirty and stuff, but you should bend on that thing and, and take care of it. Yeah. Yep. That's very true. Anything else, Jaden, from you? Uh, just a reminder that <clears throat> not all... Not all. So we talked about some cleaning solvents that work. There's a lot that don't that we've tried. That's and, true. And they didn't do a thing. Um, so try to try to be deliberate. Try to assess it based off some value. Um, I, I I'm really a fan of the the reference concept for that because right you're you're limited on tools and probably money and stuff. You know, as I know I was right. Yeah. When when I was reloading and shooting on my own and stuff. So, um, but clean your barrel. Take care of your gun. Like Matt said. Um, Every time you see an issue uh, that looks like it might be pressure associated, understand it may not be the ammunition. It may be, right? Yeah. It certainly could be. Um, but that's not the only source of pressure. It can come yeah. from dimensions. You might buy a brand new rifle and you're like, this thing can't be wrong. It's brand new. Don't need to clean it, right? Never been fired. But it's wrong dimensionally. That can show signs. Um, but as you use it, uh, try to try to maintain that thing and and not have problems. And if you don't, if you don't want to do that, or you can't, based on whatever circumstance, just understand the the clock may be ticking when you start to have a problem. Yeah. And that problem might just be um, a leaking primer at first, but it also could be catastrophic. It is it is safety. Yep. Well, and you mentioned that on the first podcast, and I'm glad you brought that up as you know, kind of your closing statement. Uh, specifically in the AR world, you know, two two three or five five six AR just gets ridden like a rented mule and worked and worked and worked and people that depend on these guns workers that have these guns and if you don't properly maintain that rifle the ammo could be perfectly in spec and a high pressure event when it occurs there's no distinguishing that rifle it wasn't maintained properly and the excessive carbon buildup caused the high pressure or the round was high pressure. It's indistinguishable. It does the same thing. Right. And in a lot of times, that's a problem. And and you could have avoided that whole situation with some proper barrel maintenance. Yep. Awesome. Well, guys, with that, I have nothing else. And uh, hopefully we can get episode three recorded in a little bit shorter timeline than yeah. uh, episode uh, one and two. What's the target? Sub two months? Is that what I got to yeah, work I think with? we were about two months out on this one. I appreciate the listener's patience for yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, looking forward to episode three. And again, you guys are both always a, a great source of knowledge, so thanks again. You bet. Welcome. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed this expansion on should you clean your barrel? And obviously that answer is yes. And this was just a peek into some of the stuff that we use, some of the practices that we have. We hope it helps you with your barrel maintenance, and we'll catch you on the next one.